Uh, my name is Mike Waters. I'm a graduate of the Whiting School of Engineering in 2006 and also a member of the Johns Hopkins Alumni Council. And we're hosting Alumni Weekend for y'all. Thank you for coming to this morning's uh, Hop Talk. Come on in, an update on the DART mission. Asteroids have and will continue to cross Earth's path. And it's not a question of if, but when, ask the dinosaurs. In today's presentation, we're excited to receive an update from Dr. Elena Adams, a key mission engineer about what NASA and the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab have learned after the groundbreaking mission to change the orbit of an asteroid through the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART. Today's presentation is also being live streamed. And I would like to welcome any online viewers tuning in through Hopkins at Home, which is a di digital live stream platform for alumni and the public to experience Hopkins lectures like this year round from home. Our in-person and virtual audiences will have the opportunity to answer questions in a Q&A session following the presentation. So prepare those along the way. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our faculty moderator, Kevin Lewis. Kevin is an associate professor with the Morton K. Blaustein Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences in the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. His research focuses on the problems of planetary geophysics from the scale of a grain of sand all the way up to the crust of a planet. He has worked in depth on the nature of sedimentary rocks of Mars and what they might record about the planet's past climate and habitability. He's also interested in understanding the large scale properties of planetary lithospheres using magnetic gravity and topography data sets. Please join me in welcoming Kevin to the podium. So if you go look up the list of near-Earth objects that NASA tracks, what you'll find is that the Earth has a close encounter with a decently large object about once a day, sometimes several times a day. I always look this up when I give my asteroids lectures in class. Um, and today is the first time I looked it up and we have no close encounters. <laughs> But we have a 100 meter diameter object coming close to the Earth the next three days. So I don't know exactly what a 100 meter diameter object is, but I think it will do to us, but I think it's not good. Um, at any rate, this is a serious problem uh, that, that we have to deal with. Um, and, uh, and so this is what we're going to hear about today. Uh, so hopefully you're aware that in addition to our lovely campus here, we have the Applied Physics Lab. Uh, down in Laurel, Maryland, that builds all sorts of exciting spacecraft like the DART mission. And shortly we'll hear from Dr. Elena Adams uh, about this uh, amazing and successful mission that uh, just happened a few months ago. Um, and then I'll moderate some questions afterwards. Uh, and so uh, save up your questions for then. Uh, so let me spend a, a moment introducing Dr. Adams. Um, she has degrees, I have to say it because it's just so many, it's applied math, astronomy, uh, ocean, o atmospheric, oceanic, and space sciences, uh, and space systems engineering. Okay, she's now a program manager at APL, and she's worked on missions too. I ha also have to do this list because it's so amazing. The sun. And embarrassing. I know, but it's so good. The sun, the earth, the asteroids, the Jupiter system, Mars, the Saturn system, and since we did our pre-mission lecture, she has also done moon missions now as well, which we've been talking about together. Um, <laughs> so uh, Dr. Adams is, among other things, the lead mission systems engineer for DART. Can I say was? No. We Not yet. She still is the lead mission systems engineer for DART, um, which hopefully you're aware was um, uh, successful uh, several months ago. Um, and today uh, we'll hear um, about the exciting uh, history and success and, and results of that mission. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Elena Adams. All right, so very happy to be here today. I, first, can you guys hear me okay? All right, all right. Uh, I will also have to lean. This really has to be done better for taller people. Uh, engineering improvement, guys, engineering improvement. 
All right, so I will talk today about the double asteroid redirection test, and I'll talk about the results after six months of the impact, but first I will talk about what the DART mission was, how we got there, what we did, and then talk about what we have been doing since, because uh, there have been some exciting stuff we found out. So that's the basics of the DART mission. Go to the Didymo system, hit an asteroid, and see if you can move it in space. The motivation for the mission is very straightforward. If an asteroid was coming toward Earth, how can you change its trajectory in such a way that you can actually move it out of the way and make sure that it doesn't impact Earth? We are not dinosaurs. We do not want it uh, die the dinosaur way. So, uh, and we have a space program, so we should use it for good. All right, so uh, first things first, a little bit of motivation for the asteroids that we picked. We went to a binary asteroid system. So a binary asteroid system is two asteroids. One is larger, 780 meters, called Didymos, the bigger one, somewhere between Burj Khalifa and One World Trade Center. And then there was a moon that was orbiting around this larger asteroid called Dimorphos. And Dimorphos itself is about 163 meters. So somewhere between, you know, the Great Pyramid of Giza, that really should be over to the left now that I'm seeing this awesome graphic, but, and the Statue of Liberty, basically it's two football fields in size. And uh, we have traveled 110 million miles to be able to hit it within two meters of the target. So um, I just kind of you know, gave away the punchline. But um, so this is uh, what happened. Uh, Didymos sits there in the center. It actually rotates at about two and a half um, hours. Uh, once, but then Dimorphos goes around it in an orbit, and that orbit was 11 hours and 55 minutes. Uh, Dart came in, uh, hits Dimorphos. Uh, let's go off a little CubeSat as well called Leech Cube, which observes our impact, and you will see some fantastic images of that. And then that changes the orbit of the smaller asteroid around the larger asteroid. And the goal is to see how much will it really nudge it, right? It's a nudge. It's not a huge impact. It's the basic physics, one half mv squared. This is how much energy we're going to impact into it. And that is going to change the orbit. So the idea is very simple. However, the execution is a little harder. So um, afterwards, we measure how much we change that orbit by looking at it from the ground via ground-based telescopes because you can see that the light around the larger telescopes dims, right? Every time Dimorphos passes in front of Didymos. So we see this light dimming, and that's how we measure the period of the smaller object around the larger object. So you do these observations afterwards by the ground-based telescopes, and that tells you, did you actually do anything? Because we do, a lot of, uh, we do a lot of measurements in the labs where we shoot things at little pellets on little surfaces and see the ejecta come out and see the plumes come out and then we make a lot of really grand theories about how this is really going to work in real life. But the goal of this mission was to do a test to figure out how does it actually work? Does it work as we predicted? And then to get better models for the future of the planetary defense. So this is our spacecraft that we took to the asteroid. We built it here at the Applied Physics Laboratory. I've been on this project since about um, a few years prior to launch, about five years prior to launch. And uh, we built the spacecraft. Uh, we developed all of the technology that was required to actually perform this. And we also demonstrated a lot of new technology for NASA, too. Additional new types of ion engines, new types of solar arrays that roll out like blankets. You see our really long solar arrays. Uh, we have smart navigation, what allows us to actually target and hit the surface of the asteroid. And the Applied Physics Laboratory, I will just say, is also a Navy laboratory as well, and they do a lot of work for the Department of Defense. So some of the algorithms that we use in this mission actually come from the uh, developments for the Missile uh, Defense Agency of how to target dark things in space that you don't see. So we also carried, because you know, planetary defense is not just a US thing, right? It's a world endeavor. 
I would say it's a world sport uh, right now. And um, uh, so we carried an uh, a small CubeSub from Italy called Leecher Cube, and we deployed it 15 days prior to arrival, and that Leecher Cube flew by afterwards and took pictures. We used to call it SelfieSat, but NASA didn't like that name. <laughs> So instead, it's a very uh, convoluted light Italian CubeSat for imaging of the asteroids. Well, that would have stuck with SelfieSat. Okay, so we knew very little about the object we were going to. Uh, Didymos, the larger asteroid, we knew a little bit more. We've been observing it since 1996. In 2003, it had a close flyby of Earth where we actually looked at it and we had a pretty good idea of what the shape of the asteroid looked like. Or so we thought, you will see that mm, maybe not as well as we thought we knew. But we really had no idea of what Dimorphos looked like, which is the asteroid we were trying to hit. Because the only thing we could see from the ground was that the light around Didymos would dim every 11 hours and 55 minutes. From that, you could derive some sizes, ideas for the asteroids. That's where we thought it was, 163 meters. There was an uncertainty around that. But that is all we knew. We didn't know what the shape it was. Imagine targeting something. You don't know what a shape it was. Imagining uh, that you have the light coming in from from side, we have a visible camera on board called Draco, and that's what actually imaged the asteroid and tried to find its center. And then we took those images into our spacecraft, and then al algorithms on the spacecraft would change the trajectory of the spacecraft depending on how it was going, and try to target the asteroid based on the images it was taking. So we trained our SmartNav algorithms, uh, like we call them, uh, a lot on during the 10 10-month cruise to the Didymos system, we trained it a lot on other uh, objects. Here you're seeing the results of the tests of um, actually of looking at Jupiter and waiting for uh, the Jupiter moons emerge. And we are basically we're fooling our smart nav into thinking about Didymos is Jupiter, and you know Dimorphos is Io, actually coming in from behind Jupiter, and that's how we train our algorithms to make sure that they actually know how to how to expect these asteroids, uh, you know how they separate and how we actually start uh, guiding on them. So we did a lot of tests, uh, but we detected. Didymos, which is the larger moon, for the first time using our camera, about 45 days prior to impact. And as we watched it, uh, on the left you're seeing us over the 30 days prior to impact, just every five hours we took a bunch of images, brought them down on Earth, analyzed our trajectory, fed back, and performed maneuvers. So we slowly, it emerged as brighter and brighter as we got closer to it, but we still had no idea what Dimorphos was. So at about 15 days prior to impact, we kicked off Leachy Cube. That went well, well, as well as it could have been. So it uh, didn't bounce off our long solar rays, which was a problem we thought about before. Um, so Leachy Cube got kicked off. They were behind us. And then we started talking via DSN, which is the Deep Space Network, uh, constantly with the ground, making our last adjustments, doing our last tests. And then at eight hours, uh, and we were in the mock, I would say, way before then. Some of us were there since, you know, four in the morning. The impact was um, at 7 p.m. It was very exciting. So we were there for a long period of time, but we were doing the last checks on the ground, making sure everything's correct. And then at six hours, we transitioned to an autonomous mode. At four hours prior to impact, we became completely autonomous. So this, we, don't, we are not able to control the spacecraft from the ground at that time because of the light time and what kind of uh, commands we would have to say. So uh, the actual whole timeline, the spacecraft completely autonomously finds the asteroid, then transitions over to the smaller asteroid uh, called Dimorphos. And then at, at about, I don't know, I would say 68 minutes, it finally was able to find Dimorphos. And at 75 minutes prior to that, I took a lot of engineers out of the room and told them, OK, get ready. If we don't see it in the next 15 minutes, we have to start enacting our contingency procedures. We had 21 contingency procedures that we were going to enact in case we were not seeing the asteroid. Because we didn't know, would it be on one side or the other, right? Because the models could be wrong. Uh, we didn't know what the shape was. Um, how do we actually, you know, the thing was supposed to do it um, 
they impact autonomously. How is that really going to work? So um, at two and a half minutes, this is what you're seeing is we are really seeing Dimorphos for the first time well enough. And then at 12 seconds, we got the first good images. And then at two seconds, we impacted. So this whole time, we're streaming images back to Earth from um, 65 million miles away. And, uh, and all the way out to less than a second prior to impact. So what I will do is I will show you guys this movie. And uh, did that work? It has. I'm oh. starting to see individual oh, boulders on Didymos. Um, unbelievable, unbelievable Smart clarity of images there. Coasting on in, our projected mist distance is going to be about 17 meters. Oh, my gosh. <gasps> oh, wow. We're waiting visual confirmation. All right. We got it? Waiting. Waiting. Yeah, and the we last we image was less than 0.8 seconds away. In the name of planetary yeah. defense. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Amazing. What a team. What, what a team and what an accomplishment. So we had a lot of people both at Hopkins and at APL um, and all over the world, of course, watch the impact. Uh, it was a big deal for us. Uh, it was a huge deal for planetary defense overall. And actually a first step for Earth in the ability to deflect asteroids. So uh, in the meantime, as everybody was watching, Leecher Cube, three minutes later, flew by, took these images of what we did. And you can see Dimorphos is right there. And uh, they brought it down also first. This is the first pl deep space planetary cube set that worked. So go Leecher Cube. Uh, what you're also seeing in the images is amazing uh, strands coming off all of the streamers and people are actually now really looking at the streams coming off of uh, Dimorphos and seeing individual boulders and counting and that is informing a lot of uh, future of how what we actually to understand what the impacts are like. So also at the same time, while we were all celebrating uh, in the Mission Operations Center, the, many of the telescopes got to work. We have telescopes on every single continent that have been observing the impact and in space as well. JWST and HST got to work because this was a really ideal time for us to observe it. We timed our arrival at Didymos such that we would be able to observe it from Earth. Not only can we stream the data all the way back as fast as possible, but actually we hit it just as Didymos and Dimorphos are closest to Earth at this point, 0.07 AU, 65 million miles away. So that was really exciting. And this is a very, very slow uh, version of this, but um, it fell much faster when you're there. So um, also at the same time as we were in the mock, this happened. And that was the image, you know, I watch, you know, I, I've been on this mission for a long period of time. We have rehearsed things multiple, multiple times. So as we were in the mock and you saw us jumping up and down, it really felt a lot like the simulations that we have run over and over again. So it wasn't that much of a surprise to us. But when we were done and we were walking over to the press conference center and somebody sent me a text with this right here that they observed and it was within minutes of impact and i was like guys we did what look at this and that is you're watching didymos the bigger asteroid right not dimorphous the little moon and seeing all of that ejecta come out in that one second it was just most amazing but of course that didn't stop then hst and jwst continues to observe this for months we saw that it created a tail because the tail and, you know, you're like, oh, did you make a comet? No, we did not make a comet. That's crazy. Um, well, what we actually saw is that the radiation pressure from the sun pulls out the ejecta and it's creating this really, really long tail. So, oh, you know, 12 days post impact, you saw the small tail as we went through. Um, we saw a larger and larger tail emerge. And for a while there, there were multiple tails, uh, then they went away. And now you can see this is 50 days post impact from the Lowell Discovery Telescope. You can see this one long tail 
uh, 88 days past impact, tail still there, and now the tail is getting fainter, right? So all of this uh, stuff that got kicked off when we hit the asteroid, that's, uh, you're still uh, seeing it there. So this is a November Hubble Space Telescope, took these amazing images of the tail, and uh, the tail is getting fainter and fainter. And we expect it to be basically dissipating in the next couple of months. And that is how this mission ends. We stop observing it. But the happy note, uh, the big question was always, so how much did you move the asteroid, right? That was the big question. Um, we had predictions. We had predictions from anywhere between 72 seconds. We're going to change the orbit of this asteroid from 11 hours and 55 minutes to 11 hours and 53 minutes. We had predictions of you're going to change it by an hour. Right? And if you think about the actual applicability of this mission, which is you go and you try to move an asteroid in space in order to prevent it from hitting Earth, you kind of want to know, are you going to move it just a couple of uh, seconds or are you going to move it hours? So um, we found that we actually moved it 33 minutes which was a little bit larger than the original expectation was. The original expectation was that if you go and you just hit an asteroid and you transfer the momentum from the spacecraft, that is 590 kilos, and it's moving at 6.4 kilometers per second, which is 14,000 miles an hour for those of you um, who count. And um, yeah, so we're moving pretty fast. So if you took all of those parameters and you put it together, you get a change of about seven minutes. Now, why was it so big? Why was it 33 minutes? And that is the question uh, that we're trying to answer. In the meantime, of course, people were online. The NASA administrator was super excited to announce that the DART has successfully changed the orbit in space. Uh, but the really exciting result is here. So if you hit it, this is the seven minute case is all the way in the left and there's no stuff coming out of the asteroid, you would move it by seven minutes. But if you have a lot of ejecta coming out, the plume of stuff that you saw that's stretching out, that is how you get that enhancement. It's called the momentum enhancement, and basically it works the same. It's a recoil effect. Uh, for every action, there's some sort of reaction, right? So you have this thruster that you create at the side of the asteroid, and that's what allowed us to change it. So uh, we found that this momentum enhancement factor was about 3.6, which is three, this is where that 33 minutes comes from. So very excited about this, but of course that also, it depends on so many things. And one of the things that it depends on is exactly how we hit the asteroid. And uh, here's an image right before we hit, uh, from uh, kind of the final 10 images, and this is a composite, you can see the middle part where we're about to hit is, has the highest resolution, and the rest of it looks a little fuzzy. So um, we've been trying to figure out the shape of Dimorphos as part of that, and uh, we had a lot of uh, scientists who went out and started looking at what are the, really the shapes are like. So um, the number one thing we saw was that there's this tail all the way on the right, and uh, people started comparing it with fish. That's right. Um, here's, uh, if you wanted to really compare it with fish, uh, you can see that you can do it really well. And um, if you're a fish aficionado, uh, there's probably one type of fish that Dimorphos is like. The other piece of it, of course, is that we've been doing a lot of modeling of the shape of the Dimorphos because all of that goes into the models. And and uh, people have been performing really important observations with comparing different types of candy with the shape of Dimorphos. And uh, the number one, um, and, you know, it depends, it depends, but we found uh, that we think the peanut butter M&M is the best analog. So if somebody asks you whether it's like a Skittle, no, it is not. Okay. And I hope that, yes, that's right. And people actually publish the stuff online. Look. <laughs> so you're welcome. You're welcome. OK, back to the regular scheduled programming. Um, we hit uh, all, of the, uh, all of the boulders on Dimorphos are now named after various percussion mechanisms because, you know, impact. <laughs> I know. We're so funny. Um, so we hit right be between Bodron and Adabak. 
Uh, you can see the DART orientation, uh, uh, how we actually impacted the asteroids. So people have been doing a lot of simulations. We are finding that we actually hit Adabak first and then followed closely the solar rays impacted background. And that matters because this is how you transfer the momentum into the asteroid. And which angle you're coming in matters as well. So all of that is very exciting, and we think we know where the, we model all the shapes, we model the boulders, and do impact ejection simulations to try to show that what we saw using Leecher Cube and what we're seeing now is the same thing. So pretty exciting stuff. And here's a good image of Leecher Cube and what we're actually simulating. This gives us a really good feeling, because at the end of the day, this mission is not just a test, a random test. This is for protection of the world. So this is the fireballs reported by US government from 1988 to about February of this year. What you're seeing is impacts. Earth is being bombarded all the time by various asteroids and comets and other solar system debris. There's dust that uh, was there from the origin of the solar system that is actually impacting our atmosphere. And it most of the time it burns up in the atmosphere and it's fine. Sometimes it gets closer, and sometimes it, there's an impact in the atmosphere, and sometimes there's an impact on the surface. So here, what you're seeing here is how much energy gets deposited as any of these impacts occur. And this is observed by both ground-based telescopes, but a lot of also DOD assets as well. So the big red one right there was Chelyabinsk. So that was in 2013. You might have remembered the dash cam videos of people watching this bolide coming in, bursting in the atmosphere. Over 1,000 people were injured, um, tons of broken windows. People should not, when they see a bolide coming, please don't run to the windows because it's a bad idea. 90 seconds later, the windows shatter because of the pressure wave. Please do not do it. Uh, but the point is, these things happen all the time. In fact, here's a kind of a hazard by numbers chart. A four meter object coming into the atmosphere happens constantly. Uh, most of the time, what you're seeing is a shooting star, and you make a wish, and you're like, this is great. Bright flash, sometimes there are meteorites, people celebrate, and everybody goes home, unless you're that guy who gets hit by a meteorite. Um, well, then there's also, of course, the 25 meter object, and that's the one that I just showed you just now. That was kind of the Chilabin size. There's an airburst, an explosion. And we know very few of those, right? All of these asteroids they, and objects, they're very dark. They're hard to see. People have to observe them multiple times in order to be able to predict their trajectories. So sometimes we just can't see those. However, the happy note is that the 10 kilometer ones that um, dinosaurs got killed by, we know where those are. There's four. So if you guys need to know that for a fun fact, if four, uh, four of those, we know where they are, we can track them very well, uh, we will not be dinosaurs. However, uh, you know, when we get down to a uh, uh, one kilometer size, uh, we know about 95% of those, 5% of those are unknown. And then by the time you get to 140 meters, which is where Didymos and Dimorphos were, sorry, Dimorphos was a more, um, Dimorphos was the one about 140 meters. So we only know 41% of those. And 41% is, you know, we're, we're trying to get assets up there to observe the rest of them. And we have a congressional mandate, actually, to observe more of these and really track them and make sure we know where they are. Because those things are um, not great. So uh, as an example, um, here's a meteor crater, Behringer crater, meteor crater. I don't know if any of you, has, have any of you been in Arizona, visited the crater? So there's the Behringer crater. Uh, it was formed uh, about 50,000 years ago by a 50 meter metallic asteroid. And um, it's the crater itself is about 1.2 kilometers deep and about, oh sorry, 1.2 kilometers in size and about 180 meters deep. So not that big, but still big enough. So when that meteor hit, um, we would have had a fireball that went out about 10 kilometers uh, out to 24 kilometers, there was kind of the large animals, and we, we, we consider ourselves large animals, or would have been wounded, and uh, out to 40 kilometers, a hurricane force winds. Like, just to give you a feel for this, because nobody knows what 40 kilometers um, really is, other than people in Europe. Um, 
here's DC. So imagine a 50 meter, 50 meter, not the size of Dimorphos, but a 50 meter coming into DC. So wipes out all the DC fireball, completely DC is completely gone, going out to Maryland um, and all the way to Annapolis, you have hurricane force winds. So if a 50 meter asteroid can do this kind of devastation, the fact that we know less than 100, you know, a 440 meter, that and that is a much larger scale. So we need to know where they are. We need to be able to actually mitigate them. So uh, of course, planetary defense people are all get very excited. We have conferences every four years. We get together and then we try to kill off different places depending on the year. Uh, sometimes it's Tokyo, sometimes we land an asteroid in London and we play these war games basically. What are you doing to prevent an asteroid? How do you actually communicate to the community about asteroid strikes? How do you actually evacuate people? Because for maybe for a smaller asteroid, you do let it hit, you just evacuate the area. So uh, there's a lot of coordination between different agencies like FEMA and NASA, but NASA is the one, and a lot of the DO, Department of Defense agencies and uh, Space Force now as well. But all of that is, the head of that is actually planetary defense at NASA because it is thought to be a civilian issue, right? And we coordinate across the whole world on this. So number one, step in mitigation for the asteroids was kinetic impact, which is what we did with DART. There are other ones too. For something that you find very quickly, actually, and it is a large enough size, nuclear disruption might be the key. Um, another way, you could kinetically disrupt the asteroid too. So instead of just completely blowing it to smithereens, you, you just tap it a little bit. So we did the deflection, which is just move the asteroid, but all of these all of these different methods focus on changing the trajectory of the asteroid in order to be able to move it from impact to Earth. So as I said, planetary defense is an office at NASA, has been an office since 2016. We're part of that office. And we're also part of the larger strategy of the White House strategy. We just, uh, White House just came out with yet another uh, version of the strategy uh, just a couple of weeks ago revealed at the Planetary Defense Conference. And we are definitely part of the new deflection and disruption mitigation. But we're also part of the international collaboration. Because in just three short years, HERA, which is a European Space Agency mission, is going to arrive at Didymos and it's really going to observe what exactly did we do and spend a lot of time there characterizing the crater and then actually land on Dimorphos to understand what happened. I'm hoping that they will find the piece of solar ray just sticking out, probably not, but you know. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I just like to remind people that this was like a human-sized spacecraft, just two meters tall, I'm that tall, that was sent to deflect an asteroid and it had a fantastic impact. So uh, last video. We're embarking on a new era of humankind. Didymos and Dimorphos make a great target. We needed an asteroid with a moon that you can see from ground-based telescopes around the world. We're doing this mission to prove that we can deflect an asteroid. Five, four, three, Two, one, and liftoff of the Falcon 9 and DART on NASA's first planetary defense test to intentionally crash into an asteroid. Even if we do everything right, our sensors work well, our spacecraft is doing well, even then we might still miss. Four, three, First time ever, humanity has changed the orbit of a planetary object. NASA confirms that DART successfully changed the targeted asteroid's trajectory.
using the ground-based telescopes around the world to watch the system and see how it's affected by this impact event. This is a watershed moment for planetary defense and a watershed moment for humanity. All right, any questions? <laughs>what we were doing is we were doing a very safe test of the asteroid deflection. What, um, we could have gone, made the asteroid um, orbit larger or smaller, depending which side we came in on. We chose to make it shorter because it's easier to observe from the ground. So instead of changing it closer to like 12 hours, which meant that only half of the telescopes could observe it at a time from Earth, we actually shrunk the orbit in such a way that we could enable more telescopes from the ground being able to uh, observe it. But what happens in real life, uh, they're usually an asteroid orbiting the sun, and sometimes the trajectory of that asteroid passes close to Earth. Those are the ones that are called potentially hazardous objects. And those asteroids, you want to be able to change their orbit just a little bit. However, without doing a first test, and you just go and you slam into one of these things, what tells you that you didn't change it in such a way that it actually comes back and, you know, in just a few years and smacks the Earth anyways? Or uh, you changed it in such a way that you disrupted an asteroid and now all of these pieces are coming towards you. That's what the test was about. Can you do it on a big planetary body? Does it go in the way that you expected it to? And then see what happens. The answer is minuscule, but yes, because they are gravitationally, um, they're gravitationally tied. So um, the change of that smaller orbit does change the orbit of the large asteroid, but it is so small that it's basically negligible. And we did a lot of calculations early on to prove that that's the case. And we also calculated that we can't just knock out the other one, and it's gonna, now it's gonna be on the trajectory to Earth as well. Because we, were, we did a very small tap. I mean, it's a 5% a change in the orbit. what we basically vision that they're coming from the sun. And yes, that is harder. And um, in fact, if you see some news articles out there, they say, oh, here's an asteroid that's coming from the sun. We didn't detect it until late. Um, so yes, that is an issue that people have to be able to be looking close to the sun. Um, it does mitigate some of the things can be mitigated by the fact that we have now uh, a new observatory that is going to be being launched into space. And they can actually get a little bit closer to the sun and observe, uh, because they're rotating with Earth around the sun, they will be able to actually get many more of these objects. I don't think it was because that's been in the works for a long period of time. However, uh, planetary defense is uh, by its nature of interest to the DOD side as well. In fact, uh, Space Force is very interested in trying to figure out ways of how to do the next mitigations as well, in addition to, um, of course, the civilian side. Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, another, so I took out some slides because there were already 60 of them. I figured you guys didn't need all of them. But uh, we were observing the Didymo system using planetary radar. And planetary radar is also very interesting to the cislunar domain as well, the uh, near moon domain. So there is a lot of uh, overlap between trying to observe the asteroids with a radar um, and in, in fact, in one of those images, in 2003, closest approach of Didymos was observed by radar. So there is some overlap between planetary radar as a whole, as in observing the moon and objects around the moon as it becomes a contested domain, and also uh, the actual 
uh, near-Earth objects, which nobody wants to contest. <laughs> so we did get a question on chat. Um, was there a specific reason why the SmartNav algorithms needed more training during cruise um, rather than the training you could just do on the Earth? Uh, oh, I don't have to repeat it. This yeah. is awesome. <laughs> so the question was, um, actually, yes, because there's, there's only so much you can do from the ground. Uh, we simulated everything from the ground, we thought. We simulated bodies of all different shapes and sizes. We simulated responses of the spacecraft, because at the end of the day, how your spacecraft responds to commands to move via smart nav really matters. Uh, but you need to have the thing flying and in space in order to be able to characterize your sensors and how your sensors behave. Little jitters on the spacecraft, like, let's say, a heater turns on on one panel. You notice that in where you actually, your spacecraft thinks it's pointed. And your spacecraft might mistake that little turn on of the heater that you think that the asteroid has actually moved. And then the spacecraft tries to react to the fact that the asteroid moved and moves you too far away, therefore missing. I will tell you guys that at, in July of uh, 2022, we hit in September, there was about 50% probability that we hit, miss. And that was because of we found all of these things uh, that, you know, heaters turning on and off in the spacecraft us pointing in a particular orientation, all of that was affecting our probability of actual impact. So we had to train our algorithms and tune all of that out, that by the time it got to be September, let's say 15th, not that I know the dates, uh, uh, we were at about 99% probability of impact, and it made us sleep better at night. <laughs>papers, yes. Yeah. So Tunguska happened in uh, 1908. Uh, it happened in Siberia. So if you live in Siberia, it's what your lab is as well. You just you should just not go outside. Um, <laughs> but uh, so uh, that happened in uh, 1908. It was about a 160 meter object. It leveled out many acres of forest. And um, and so there, there are papers that I, at least I've read that talk about that being an asteroid, not a comet per se. So since then, I think the understanding is that it's, uh, you know, it's 110 meter to 160 meter there, depending on the, on the model that you use uh, for that object. So, but the answer is yes, comets can go into the atmosphere of Earth and they will do an impact just as well. Uh, comets are mostly made out of water there's a much smaller rockier component. So therefore, most likely they will burn up in the atmosphere. A lot of it will burn up in the atmosphere on entry, but if there is a rocky core, then it will impact Earth. It also could air burst depending on the porosity, which is how dense that object is, right? So the 50 meter that hit to create the Beringer crater, like awesome. Right, uh, that was a metallic asteroid. Actually, Beringer, who bought the crater, spent many years trying to dig up all of the surface, trying to look for that melted core. As it turns out, when you hit um, uh, at those speeds, uh, the thing melts, so he never did find the core. But he spent a lot of years digging. Uh, and his family still owns the crater, so when you went, for example, you had to pay a fee to the family of Beringer. In any case. Um, yeah. I think that was the, the question. <laughs> it really depends of uh, what the asteroid is made out of. People have models uh, about uh, different types of asteroid, different types of porosity. If it's very porous, maybe um, it would actually blow up in the atmosphere earlier and then, um, and I'll let Kevin yeah. add to it. <laughs> Level the part. Yeah. yeah. And the answer is yes, we have been doing some analysis. There been, have been some spectroscopic observations. They're still ongoing, so I, I can't really, uh, we haven't really published them yet. So, uh, but the answer is yes, we have been doing, uh, please come see results in a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> next reunion, we'll have Yeah, that. next reunion. <laughs> And the answer is yes, they have been looking. That's how we know some of the, um, you know, 
before we got there, we collected all the data we had by various telescopes. And Spitzer and US were some of them. We also had a lot of observations from the ground that all go into the, what the uncertainty was in the size and, um, and the shape, right? We thought it was kind of an um, ellipsoid and it, it looks like a potato or a fish. That is basically what we were already thinking it was like. It's a, it was a little bit of a different uh, ratio of axis, uh, but we had some predictions on that. Uh, the answers, the, in terms of uh, dart success, we did not carry. In fact, we were trying to figure that out. And um, in real life, though, um, if there was an asteroid coming towards Earth, what you would do is you would do a quick flyby mission or something beforehand to do some of this. Is it a rubble pile? Is it look like it's a solid chunk? Uh, these measurements would be done prior to, prior to going out there and trying to deflect it. So that's in fact, um, NASA has gotten together with the whole planetary science community and they, every 10 years they get together and they come out, these are the priorities that we're going to do. And for the first time uh, in this 10 years, they actually said that planetary defense is part of that. And the first mission they recommended is after you find all the asteroids, you need to go out there and show that you can do a quick flyby and characterize it. So that way, when I showed that beta factor, the 3.6 factor, but that transfer the momentum, you kind of need to know that before you impact it because of the fact that, you know, that, that really tells you what you need to be doing hmm. and by how much force you need to hit it with or, you know, ablate it with, depending on the type of method you use. Not tomorrow. <laughs> uh, frankly, it takes a while. Uh, and we did a study recently where we did an exercise with planetary defense and um, FEMA and the White House, where we actually looked at an asteroid that was six months out and coming. Could you do anything about it? And at the end of the day, we let it hit and just evacuated the area. Um, there are some mitigation uh, strategies that y you would try to put together a mission real fast. You would use whatever ground asset you had and you would try to launch it on the trajectory on the first available launch vehicle. But all of these things take time because you are not sure whether you, it, it, all of these things are very complicated, right? How do you make sure that your spacecraft is not gonna be shaken apart by, uh, by the launch vehicle that you chose to put it on? Um, how do you know that you have the right technology? You know, coming up with your sensors to actually detect how you're going to hit the asteroid and the algorithms incorporated into the smarts of the spacecraft, that takes time, that requires testing. So six months is probably unrealistic unless you have something sitting on the ground. Um, three years is more realistic and definitely you can do something about, uh, but it also depends on the size of the thing that you need to throw up there. Happy note is that hopefully very soon we'll see the first Starship fly, <laughs> and those things are 330,000 pounds. So yes, throwing something like a Starship on there, maybe that's a way to go for a larger object too. You know, um, people always come back to us and say, hey, you know, well, the nuclear should fix it. You should just throw a bunch of nukes up there. And you're like, hey, Bruce Willis tried, and look what he's at. <laughs> uh, but frankly, there is this thing called nuclear proliferation th treaty. And setting off, you know, nukes in space is prohibited by international convention. And all of those kind of negotiations and you know, everybody coming together takes time. So um, that's also not the answer. So the answer is it depends. And it depends on the size of the asteroid and how early did you detect it. And how well do you know the trajectory? The other question we also struggle with, and sorry, I'm just kind of going off. Um, the other question we struggle with is that if you deflect it, but you don't deflect it enough, and now you deflect it into a different territory on Earth, because usually, right, uh, it becomes an international issue. So these are all things we consider as we go through these exercises. With the launch vehicle, it was $323 million. And uh, $69 million of that was the launch vehicle. 
uh, for a planetary mission, uh, that is actually a mission that goes out into deep space. It was cheap. Uh, most of the planetary missions, when you look at Mars, you look at JWST, uh, for a small price to save the Earth. Wow, this should be a tagline. <laughs> <laughs>Uh, the answer is it was, uh, was former. Uh, we designed the algorithm around hitting the lit center of the object. So we had a visible camera, which means you know part of the asteroid was in the darkness, part of it was in light. We wanted to hit the center of the lit portion. And we did that within two meters, which is kind of amazing. Still blows my mind a little. Um, the answer is yes, it does. And also where you hit on the asteroid matters too. Uh, if you hit the asteroid in a corner, you, you'd spend some momentum kind of spinning up the asteroid and your ejecta, which is that thruster that we created that actually pushed it further, uh, might go the other direction. We were getting to uh, some answers if we were hitting it off to the side and at a, at, at a wrong angle, we actually could uh, we could slow it down instead of speeding it up. <laughs> so you really care about the angle of impact and also where on the asteroid you hit. So the way it works is we have a camera on the spacecraft. The, we planned tests uh, where we would point the spacecraft into the area of the sky where the camera uh, field of view would be pointed towards the asteroid and then we would take some images the images would then be brought down to earth people and also algorithms would be applied to look at those images in real time and see and analyze where it is and then we would upload new commands to the spacecraft that would move the spacecraft and this is over the 10 months in the last four hours, all of that was done automatically, and the spacecraft was doing all of that itself. It would, it would search for the asteroid, it would search for the larger asteroid, it would point out, it would decide where the center of that asteroid was, and then it would command the spacecraft, move left or right or up or down, um, also deconvoluting the fact that you could be actually rotating the spacecraft as well, because we had these large solar arrays that were wiggling, uh, we, it was trying to separate how the spacecraft was rotating versus if an asteroid was actually moving. Because if you think about it, we had the larger asteroid and the smaller asteroid actually just emerged from behind the larger asteroid. So the asteroid was moving, the small asteroid was moving, the spacecraft was moving, the pointing of the spacecraft was moving. So the spacecraft had to deconvolute all of these different things in order to impact the center. So if we hit the bigger one, our mass would have had to be much, much greater. And then uh, we would change the orbit. For the first time, we would change the orbit of an object around the sun. And A, because we wouldn't be able to measure that mass change very easily, because we would have had to have a spacecraft there as well, trying to observe it the whole time. And that would have been more expensive. The question is, um, is there any technology overlap between OREX, which is OSIRIS-REx, which is a New Frontiers mission that went to the asteroid Bennu and uh, got a sample and now is going to bring it back and deposit it back to Earth in October this year, and DART? And the answer is, in the sense that there were two spacecraft, yes, but overall not so much. Um, the one thing we did learn from Bennu, which was really cool, and I'm glad we learned it before we actually impact, is that as, as, um, as OREX tried to take a sample of the asteroid, it found that it actually went in much farther than they originally thought, because the idea was that it just tags it a little bit and, uh, and grabs the sample. But in this case, the, you, if you ever see any images from OREX, which are really fantastic, you can actually see all of these things blowing off. And it was much more porous than originally thought. So um, we learned about that on DART, so we expected that maybe if our asteroid was kind of similar rubble pile asteroid, you would see this large ejecta come out.
Imagine you have a dart going through this uh, dust field and you have a visible sensor and all of a sudden you're seeing tons of asteroids instead of just one you're trying to hit. Um, yes, we actually, uh, yes, a lot of the asteroids do have some dust around them. This, this particular system we didn't think was dusty. Uh, however, we were, prepared, we were prepared for that. So our algorithm, algorithms, I'm sorry, I've been talking for a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> our algorithms were such that we could actually, over time, we would build up enough images. And the way we were tracking and getting rid of uh, dust impacts onto our camera field, that we could still uh, track the asteroid. And yeah, you know, you, uh, you would get hits on the solar arrays and that would degrade the power, how much power you're getting on solar arrays. However, for a short duration mission, because at that point you're in the field of the asteroid, it wouldn't matter. But if you wanted to survive for much longer, it's a bad idea to go through the dust cloud. All right, let's thank uh, Dr. Adams.